um, another indication of how this spirit reached um, into the popular culture. So this is William Henry Bartlett's view of Lockport. You're looking down the famous flight of locks. And it looks very ramshackle. He's doing this before the enlargement. Um, I dare say that's what it looked like, OK? Um, Lockport was one of the first big boom towns in the nation. So you were only building things for the day because you knew that in a month, probably something bigger and better would have to be built on its place. So it looks a little ramshackle. Um, so Bartlett probably sends the sketch to the guys in Europe to get it published. And what comes back <laughs> is this. Because this is the Grand Erie Canal. How could it have ramshackle buildings? So there's this, this conflict going on of, you know, how do we handle this new society? Here's a new, here's a drawing by David Vaughn, the guy I mentioned earlier, and it shows a, a Dutch farmer in the Mohawk Valley. Same could have happened out here, different ethnic groups. Um, still contented with the old ways, you know, yeah, you know, the wheat needs to be harvested, but he's in no hurry, whereas his laborer, who's probably a New England immigrant, really wants to get going um, and is getting frustrated. Okay, the burned over district. So all of these factors, all this disruption, um, new society, new people, strangers, um, new demands, um, makes this area ripe, and this area being, oh, say from Utica to just west of Rochester, histori historians have designated that this area the burned over district. And burned over in the sense that it's repeatedly swept with revivals that burn through the social landscape, one revival after another, um, as people try to adjust to new new ways. I mean, in many ways, we're going through the same thing today. Um, the internet has made a huge change in our lives, and you know, we we adjust accordingly. Um, kind of the. Well, that's this is not the right word, but the poster child for the bird over district <laughs> is Charles Grandison Finney, um, a preacher from north of Rome, who, you know, he later becomes like head of Oberlin College and the like. But early on, his his revivals, it's one of the revivals that sweep through here. I mean, he comes through Port Byron. He does a revival in Auburn in 1827. Theologically, he was probably weak at the time, but what made the difference, and this is very important, was his ability to communicate with the people. That he had a very charismatic way of preaching the gospel and making you feel like you were going to go to hell, okay, um, if you didn't do this. Um, he didn't, there was a conflict between, say, him in the Auburn Seminary, which tended to be, you know, the more conservative. He was always running into the local minister who, you know, the local minister had to be there for 30 years and had his set ways, whereas the premise of Finney was, let's disrupt things. I mean, we've got to shut all the businesses down, we've got to go out to the Great Tent, and we have to have a revival for six weeks. Oh, my. Okay. <laughs> so, um, it really happens. Um, places like Utica and Rome and Rochester are put under his spell. Um, I dare say it happened here. Um, though there's this kind of cloud to that um, horizon, um, when I say revival, don't take this wrong, I mean a very Protestant Christian revival. Okay, so here's the the published census for Cuga County uh, from 1845. Now, each of one of these lines is one of the towns in Cuga County, like Mens is this line. So this is the, you know, there's a category for Presbyterians and Congregationalists and Methodists and Baptists. Um, you can see, though, the column for the Roman Catholics, um, there's like one church. Okay, and that's in Auburn. Um, so, if you were a Catholic, um, hmm, this didn't, in, indeed that 
this revivalism kind of takes an, a slant toward nativism. That um, since the Catholics tended to be Irish, um, we didn't like the Irish. So that was a, a negative thing. Um, you know, I you sort of have to put in the same camp if you were universalist or Unitarian. Um, that, I, I don't mean that, but in the context of the revival, that was awkward times. Did that make sense? Okay. It, it's hard to participate in something that is so specifically Protestant and Christian if you're a Catholic. Okay. I mean, maybe you'd like to join. What I'm saying is that created divisions in the society. Okay, so this area, Montezuma, Menz, Brutus, right dead center in the burned over district. And it's also on the main thoroughfare. So a lot of these things come right through on the canal. Some people, yeah, get off at Wheatsport and go down to Auburn because that was the center. Um, it would have been an amazing time to come here, say, in the late 1840s. Ah, you know, um, set that aside. The biggest change, you know, if you had settled here in the late 1790s, um, how to put this? The biggest change in the landscape, the biggest change that you saw was what you didn't see, and that was the Cayuga Nation. And I know that's a difficult point today. Um, the Native Americans here, their land was taken as part of the military district to reward veterans. Now, unfortunately, many of the veterans didn't think it was ever going to happen, so they sold off their land to speculators and never really got it. Um, but nonetheless, the state went through um, and literally wiped the slate clean. Okay. Now, many of you may go walking these fields. This is the historic town of Brutus. And you could still find projectile points. Have any of you ever done that? I mean, there's still a Native American presence, if you will, in the land. And when the first settlers came, they did find evidence of these past civilizations, which probably created a sense you know, that maybe there was something grander there before you ever got there, especially these Indian forts. I'm from Onondaga County. And there, even now, there are still some of these Indian mounds. Um, but here, they, they've wiped it clean. There's no more Native American. Um, there's one road here, the Genesee Road, right there. The Cayuga <coughs> um, are placed on reservations. Um, and I won't go into that much further. Here's a map, a detail of one of the reservation maps from 1795. Most of the Cayugas you know, after the Clinton-Sullivan expedition comes through in the 1770s during the war, they head west. Um, so, what I'm trying to say is that that loss is the first thing, in a sense, that you'd see. Um, okay, this is where I'm probably going to put my foot in my mouth. Um, there was, at the time that Joseph Smith finds his tablets, many of the people in the area were, you know, they had their little seeing stones, and they were on the search for a hidden treasure. Um, it was a common belief. And the fact that you saw these remains of past civilizations, um, and I mean this in no way despairingly of the, the church, okay, so don't get me wrong, but it, it still planted in many people's mind a receptivity toward the story that's in the Book of Mormon. Now, here in Port Byron, obviously, right, this makes a special sense with Brigham Young living up the street. Um, help me remember to get back to him in a moment. Um, Young actually works on the canal. This is one of those receipts. Um, this time, instead of Ruben Bangs, the superintendent is Roderick Matson, M A T S O N. Um, and he's signing a receipt, Brigham Young down here, for payment for painting. You know, Young was a painter. Young also worked, I think, in the boatyard, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, that was the In a few years, he would 
you know, joined Joseph Smith, he heads to Canada as a missionary, does other things. 